Hello and welcome. My name is Adam Barnard. On behalf of GateWorld.net, I'm here with actor Daniel Rashid, who plays Hasuf in Stargate Origins. Daniel, thank you for joining us this morning. Hello, hello. Thank you, thank you. You, you, you got the name. The name was pretty good. Name oh, was pretty cool, good. cool. I tried. I tried my best, man. <laughs> you, 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 got the, you got some of the huh. It was, it, yeah. it, it was passable. It was passable. Right, right. <laughs> so you, we'll just jump right in. You are playing a legacy character. Of and I'll just go back to the normal name now, Kasuf, the very basic American <laughs> pronunciation. So why don't you just talk a little bit about getting cast in Stargate? At what point you found out you were playing this character that was in the original Stargate movie played by Eric Avari, and how did that affect your process and training? Sure, I got a self tape audition, which is becoming more and more common these days for actors. The casting directors will ask you to self-tape your audition like using a phone or a camera and send it into them and then they'll decide if they want to see you uh, in an in-person audition and i got a self-tape audition for a project under a code name so it was very secretive the, the role was called kasuf but uh i wasn't familiar with stargate i grew up i was a star wars kid growing up i i, I don't know i don't know if that's blasphemous no you but, can you uh, can we're not monogamous you can be we can be both great, so great. <laughs> it's okay yeah. man but what a relief um right. <laughs> so i wasn't familiar with the series and i didn't piece together that the name kasuf was from that series and because the, the name of the project was goldie and it was the weirdest self-tape i've ever received it they wanted me to improvise a short one or two minute scene of me teaching a made up language to someone off screen. I think I actually pulled up the audition breakdown on the email, my old email. Uh, oh, Cause I wow. thought it'd be interesting to read. The director would like your client to improv a scene where he's trying to teach us a made up language. He thinks it's hilarious. We can't understand something so simple. And then they included something like this as reference, but switching the rules of English and native. And they included a link to a scene from the animated version of Tarzan where Tarzan and Jane first meet and uh, she teaches him a little bit of English and he's like struggling through it, but they wanted to flip that. Right. So you're teaching a made up language. And I received this and I was like, what the hell is this? (laughs) What is this? You want me to improvise a made up, improvise a self? Okay. Okay. I'll do it. And, and I was, uh, I was on my way to an editing session with some friends of mine when I received this email. And so I, thought about like what I would say. I thought about like, saying like, hi, my name is Kasu. You know, I'll teach that to the person off screen. And I got to the editing session and I pulled my friend Jay and I was like, all right, Jay, put this camera up. Okay. I'm going to teach you a made up language and that's all I'm going to tell you and go. And because he didn't know what I was saying and didn't know what, what, like, what the heck I was doing, it worked really well because he was like struggling <laughs> to keep up with me. And it was really fun. So we had one take of it. And then I was like, well, that was fun. Let's send that off. And we just, I sent it off and didn't think twice about it. You know, and, and usually for self tapes, you'll do like multiple takes. Right. But I was like, you know what? That was fun. I have no idea what they're looking for. Screw it. And then like two, three weeks went by. I'd see it was 20 days went by. Wow. And didn't, didn't hear anything about it. And then they wanted to call me back to do a callback with the director. And the day that they had scheduled the callback for, I had, or the time they scheduled the callback for, I had another audition already scheduled at that time so we, were, we shot back we were like hey i need a chance we could meet later in the day or earlier in the day and they only had a very small window so they they were like oh we'll have to reschedule and i thought oh shoot we probably just lost the role <laughs> and then uh and then they came back the next day and we're like i think we can go straight to offer on this and, oh wow and so then i just so i just booked the role and it helped which i realized later on is that the director of stargate origins mercedes bryce morgan went to usc where i went and we worked one day on a little web series together. And so we happened to know each other, but I didn't know that she was uh, on board for this project because we hadn't kept up very much since we graduated. So it's funny how, how those things come back around. So I think because she knew me and knew my work, they felt comfortable just, you know, looking at me right, right, right away. So it's good to see a familiar face pop up in casting. It usually have a higher chance if you have that network already built in. Exactly, exactly, yeah. It's, it was the funniest audition process I, I've ever experienced, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, from self-tape to booking, it was just like, what is this? <laughs> In your experience, does it usually take that long to hear back from someone for a callback or a offer or a rejection, or is it way shorter than 20 days? It varies, but my experience is it's a lot shorter. Usually you audition, like, like I shot a film this past summer 
and the process was like I auditioned on Monday, I had a call back on Tuesday, I had a chemistry read on Friday, and I booked it that following Monday, and I was flying out the next Monday. It was like it was like boom. So so their, their experiences like that. Their experience is even faster. Like I shot a little co-star on Grownish this past season and I auditioned at like 6 p.m. on a Tuesday and I was on set at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. It was it was like that. Wow. Regarding origin, so you got the role. What were rehearsals like? And at what point did you start to work with Stuart Smith, the linguist who uh, Stargate Command yeah. actually wrote an article about that process? I'm going to link it in the interview notes. But for the audience, go ahead and tell us how that process evolved. So once I booked the role, I, I found out that it was, you know, this was Stargate. And I was like, oh, whoa. And then I found out that I was the young version of it, of Kasuf. And I was like, oh, whoa, I have to do this justice. You know, like this is, a, you know, like you said, it's a legacy character. And there's a certain amount of pressure that is involved with that. The danger of that is, is it like paralyzing you as an actor and having you right. want to want to make sure you that you do it right. Right. And like do a perfect impression of Eric Avari and like that's never going to happen you know he, he is Eric Avari and I'm never going to be able to do an pers- impersonation of him but it wasn't it was important for me to watch his work but only after I did my own work on the script so I wanted to make sure that I hadn't wa- I didn't watch any of the Stargate stuff until after I read the script so I read the script and did my own personal work on the role preparing for that and then I was like okay let me dive into the movie, to the few episodes of SG-1 that he's in, just to see what this life is like. You know, it's kind of a clue into, like, what my future is. Yeah. Um, if, you, if, if, if you think about it that way, it's like, we're the same person, but at much different parts in our lives. I, I received a great compliment from someone on Twitter recently who said, like, I, I could tell you, Kasuf, right from the moment you, you walked on, you have Eric Amar- Avari's mannerisms down perfectly. And that was a really wonderful compliment because, A, like, I, I love that that's what people are seeing. And B, that wasn't necessarily something <laughs> that I worked on that much. <laughs> um, but, but I'm glad that it came across because, you know, as an actor, yeah. you have the script and you have the director, right? So right. Like, you, you got to be able to trust those. You got to trust the script and trust the director. And so... I did watch the movie and his episodes of SG-1, and there were a couple of subtle gestures that I did kind of take from there and, and, and model into my work. But mainly, like, the big takeaway for me was the clue that later in Kasuf's life, he's the leader right. of this tribe. And at the beginning of this story, I uh, nobody in this tribe, basically. I'm very, I'm very low level, low level ranking person in this tribe. Yeah. And and the arc of origins for me, spoiler, I'm not going to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't seen it, but right. the arc of it for me is I kind of discover and come into my leadership role. And so that was a clue into, into like, oh, wow, this arc in this, in this origin story really is a major, you know, a major factor in my life as a whole. So that was kind of the big thing that I took from watching Eric Avari's performances. And that's, and that's honestly, that's bigger than any kind of gesture or impersonation because that, that's, a, that's a heart level kind yeah. of thing. You know what I'm saying? And that, and that will translate and affect your gestures and your mannerisms and everything without you even knowing it. And then also, I think a big part was working with Stuart and working on the language because that's a huge part of the character of these people in this world. And Stuart is just, he is the man. He is so <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to get him for this project. I would have been lost without him, seriously. Can you tell um, us a little bit more about Stuart and, and his background and what his qualifications are for this? Yeah, yeah. He's an Egyptologist and an archaeologist. And he was just out of college when he booked the job working on the original Stargate movie. He worked on that movie, and then he, he's done his own work, and he teaches up at, uh, I think you see, Santa Barbara. But in the meantime, he's also worked on many other movies. So I think he worked on the original Mummy movie, and they brought him back for some episodes of SG-1. But then at a certain point, you know, the, the television series kind of strayed away from from kind of the... The original movie mythology. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't quite as much work for him to do later on there. But he's done a lot of, like, television and film work. And it's really cool. You know, the language is, I would definitely recommend reading the article with him because the language is, it's brilliantly reconstructed. And it's something that that nobody knows what this language actually sounded like. But this is what what we think is a pretty accurate reconstruction of it. Right. Um, Because the ancient hieroglyphs, just if you want to nerd out with me real quick, the ancient (laughs) hieroglyphs are all consonants. There are no vowels in there. So you don't know what those words sound like. If you, if you lived in that time, you would just know based on the continent. 
the earliest language that is still spoken today is in that region is Coptic, but the vowel sounds are all different. One of Stuart's favorite stories about the original movie is that, so, so the god Ra is a very anglicized pronunciation of what they originally would have called the god. In Coptic, uh, I believe it's pronounced Ria, so R-E-E-U-H, if, if you want to like think about it phonetically, like Ria. But in ancient Egyptian, that uh becomes an ooh sound, so it's Liu. And so when Daniel Jackson and the crew first come into the village and, you know, Kasup's village back in the original movie, and they point up to the eye of Ra, you know, and Daniel Jackson says, you know, or someone says the eye of Ra. And then someone in the village says, Ryu. They, they can see that the film works because they wouldn't have known that Ryu was how they pronounced it back in this time. And so they didn't even understand what that, that villager said. Yeah. So the complexities of learning this, you have to pay attention, right? You can't zone out at any point yeah. during the day. Yeah, and so that was kind of like, uh, I wanted to do the role justice and I wanted to do the language justice. And we basically had two days with Stuart before we started shooting, which is crazy to think about. <laughs> like we only had two days. Uh, we had two days of rehearsal. And in those rehearsals, if you were not like rehearsing with Mercedes, the director, you would go with Stuart and you'd sit and you'd go through the script with him. And the way that the script was written is everything was written in just in English. And then if it was in bold, that means it would be spoken in ancient Egyptian. But when I got the script, I didn't have the ancient Egyptian there. I just had the bolded English. Right. So I sat with Stuart and, and what he did was he basically wrote out a phonetic translation of all the bolded words that basically was just sounds. Right? It's phonetic. So it's, it's just the sounds of, of the language. And I started working on the sounds and working on the rhythms of that just to kind of get that in my mouth and my body. But then I quickly realized, like, I can't just work on these sounds and try to memorize these sounds. I don't really know what I'm saying. I don't really know. Yeah. Like, I know what the subtitle will be. But, like, the subtitles are sometimes very clean versions uh, of what the sen sentence actually is. You know, in instead of saying, come with me to this forest, the sen sentence might be, forest we go there you know yeah. something like that. That, that that's not like an actual example but to give you an example of how a sentence might be changed in, right. in, the, in the expression of it so i was i was like i can't just do this with the sounds because these words all mean something but i don't know what the individual sounds all mean something but i don't know what they really mean so i sat down with stewart on, our, on the end of our first day and i was like okay stewart I want to re reverse translate everything that you've done <laughs> back into English. So we sat together for the rest of that day and the second day and went phonetic word, Egyptian word by phonetic word and translated them. And then I had something to say. Then I knew like what each phrase was, what each word meant and like, you know, how I was expressing that. And that was kind of, that was the biggest clue into the language for me. Right, um, And that kind of opened the door for me. And, and then it became really easy to learn a language because it was actually a language that I, I was communicating through, not just sounds that I was saying to fulfill a script. Certainly, yeah. No, that's great. You kind of want to glean the heart of what's on the page so that you can, you know, make yes. it come alive in the appropriate way that fits the story, which it's interesting. I would, I've read some stuff recently about actors and whether they like to read the backstory. Like I know in The Shape of Water, which won Best Picture this year, Guillermo del Toro wrote these really elaborate backstories for a lot of the characters. And a couple people engaged, but others didn't read it because they say it's, what, it's what's on the page that matters. It's what this moment mm. in the film is about. So if that's done well, I don't need to know what my character was doing 20 years ago. I need to know what he's doing now and what he's feeling now. So it's interesting that you say that because I see it kind of fitting into that those two different methods and there, there is really no right way i'm sure you know that with with acting exactly yeah there's no right way everyone has their own process of going about it and there were some actors on uh, origins who didn't want to learn they just wanted to memorize the sounds and for them it worked and it sounded great and it was like wow that's fantastic that works for you because that would be a lot easier for me if I could do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so at this point in the process of your journey with Stargate Origins, you know, you've been cast, you've learned the language, you've been through rehearsals. How was it to step on set 
and kind of see the pageantry and the layout of some of these sets. I mean, you must have been able to get into character really easily because you know the language, you have the costume, you have these real deserts, these real this real village. Can you just kind of give the, the listeners or the audience a perspective of what that's like and what your journey through physical production was like as an actor? Yeah, I mean, it was magical to walk onto that set at first. So the first week that we shot, we shot in uh, the village, so what we call Tent City. So all the village stuff was shot in the first week and a half or so. And that was so cool because when you walk on, you imagine, you know, you do your imagination work and imagine what your, your tribe is like, and then you walk on the set and you actually are there. And you have, you know, all these extras who are dressed up, you know, like your tribe members. And it's like, wow, all right, we live here. How cool <laughs> is this? And then it becomes, it becomes real for you. And, and so I spent a lot of time just kind of on set, even if I was not shooting, because I, I just like, I like being in the world. And it, it just makes it easier to then, when, it, when you are shooting, it makes it easier to make that switch. Not necessarily like, like, a, like a being in character all the time kind of a thing, but it's just to have that world kind of you know, ruminating and, and playing at a very low level for you. Um, and just being there in the space, it, it helps. And so the tent was really cool, and the tent city was really cool, and then the temple the temple was awesome. The desert was awesome. Which, where was that desert? Was that just outside of LA? Because I know everything production mostly takes place around LA. Yeah, we shot in Los Angeles. We were on the same soundstage for the majority of the stuff. Where you see Ten City is the same room that we shot the temple in. Oh, wow. Movie magic, baby. But then we just went out to the desert and to this like, kind of volcanic crater area. We shot out to, uh, for two days. They're like we stayed in Baker, California, which is halfway between L.A. and uh, Las Vegas. And uh, the desert is called the Dumont Dunes. Apparently, we really lucked out with our shooting day there because the first day that they scouted the desert, it was like 120 degrees or something. Oh, and like man. and like you would you you would burn your feet if like any sand touches touch anything. And wow. then the and second day that they went out, it was like. 80 degrees, but it was so windy that you couldn't go anywhere. You had, like, you had to have a mask on. You couldn't move. It was just, like unlivable. And so they were like, I really hope that we can, we could do this because this location is perfect, if not for the weather. And we show up and it's like perfect. It's like 95 degrees, which is hot, but it's still, it's not windy. Right. And did you guys shoot in summer? When was the production of the desert? This was, I think, early November or late October. I think it was early November. For post-production, they turned it around pretty quickly. I mean, you got to see the finished product within a couple months, essentially. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how they, I don't know how they turned it around so quickly, honestly. <laughs> it's like the, the timeline that they were on was insane, insane. Right. And so when you were shooting in the desert, you were with, I think, the three other young leads, right? Siobhan Aladdin, Philip Alexander, mm -hmm. and Ellie Gall, who plays Catherine Langford. I think one of the coolest scenes for me and one of the iconic scenes that came out of Origins was you explaining your name and trying to bridge that cultural divide and the audience also discovering that, you know, we've seen you before just decades from now. So how yeah. did you guys work to cultivate that chemistry and that dynamic to make it something that is kind of very playful and engaging and adventurous in spirit. Ellie and Giovanna and Philip are just, they're, they're so much fun to play with. And we got to know each other. We shot the desert, you know, that was probably two or three weeks into production. So we had known each other pretty well by that point. And we also like all like were in vans on the way out to the desert. There's an inherent chemistry and camaraderie that just kind of comes together through working long days and long hours right. together. So that scene was really fun to shoot. The scene that was written was really great. And then we added a couple of small, just like small little moments that, that helped to spice it up a little bit just to make it, you know, more humorous and more fun. And Mercedes, was, she's always like very open to, to suggestions and playing around. So it wasn't that strict, you know, you read the exact word on the page or we, we do it again kind of dynamic. It was open to, to collaboration and actors tweaking moments in the dialogue. Am I hearing that right? Or is... Yeah, but to a certain extent, right? I mean, you want, you want to, the script was well written. So you want to fulfill the script, but there's also freedom to play around within that within those constraints if that if that makes sense certainly yeah. so there are a couple of times where especially for me there were times where i feel like it would make sense for for me to say something that's not written into the script because maybe like the writers were like you know what we don't want him we don't want him to have to worry about saying another thing in this <laughs> at this moment you know small things like offhanded words so i was often i was emailing Stuart and asking them for like ad libs and stuff 
And he would email me back. And apparently that's what uh, the, the guy who played Skara in the original movie, he was apparently super into ad-libbing as well. Oh, um, yeah, is, Alexis is cool. Cruz. I also, I talked to a couple people. You, in your performance, you know, even though he's your your son, you know, because Kasuf is the father of Share and Skara, were, were, did you at all kind of look at his performance or vibe? Were the producers trying to maybe capture some of that Skara and, you know, see... Because it's he probably picked up his mannerisms and personality from his father, which you're playing at a young age. Was there any correlation there? That's really interesting, and, and I've gotten that before. That makes me really happy to hear. I think that kind of may just happen by alchemy, you know, which is kind of like. <laughs> and also, I think a big thing that helps play into that is a the writers definitely had that, you know, in their right. mind. And B, like the hair and makeup and costume and wardrobe department, they are the ones who dress me up like that. You know, I really looked like Scar. Yeah, yeah, the hair. And that was something that, uh, I can't remember who, one of the guys, I think, for Stargate Command, when they came on set and saw me in my dreads, they were like, whoa, you look like Scar. Like they, they were Kieran? just like super stoked about it. Uh, it, it, it was maybe Kieran, but I think it may have been David, David Reed. I don't know if you know okay. David Reed. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm good friends with him. Yeah, okay, right on. Right yeah, on. he was the guy who did all this before me. He did the interviews and the podcast, you know, five and 10, 15 yeah. years ago. So he got his start as, with Gate World, and now he's he's working for MGM and Stargate Command, which is super cool. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. yeah. So um, let's talk about where your character lands at the end. It was, one of the things I really loved about Origins was how it tied into the feature film in many ways, especially with where, where Ellie or Catherine Langford breaks the stone, which you also see in the movie them have to brush through the sand and find that part, that chunk of the stone that she broke off to hide the mm -hmm. full gate address. And also your moment with Aset at the end that it illuminates how you became the leader and maybe why Kasuf is who he is in the Stargate movie. And do you consider that a sad ending or something that is him fulfilling his destiny, which we'll see fully manifested hmm. in the Stargate, uh, the original Stargate movie? Right, right. What do you think? Do you think it's a sad ending? What do you think? I don't know. I mean, on one hand, you're thrust into a leadership role. On the other hand, you're kept in subjugation. And, you know, you do right. have this youthful optimism and, and generosity and warmth and when you see Kasuf later on he's a little worn down he's more cynical you know his pe people have been have labored for decades for these people they consider gods and you know it, we also play around with some stuff with uh, Catherine trying to uh, Catherine Langford trying to explain to you why these gods aren't gods and, and you're just mm -hmm. so steadfast in your belief it's like heartbreaking in some ways um, but it's also very innocent mm -hmm. I don't know I mean how did you did you yeah. have any thoughts or interpretations as you were developing the final stretch of your character's journey I, I you know I actually haven't thought about whether that's a kind of a sad ending it's, that's, that's a really interesting question because for me it just kind of is what happens you know yeah it, I, and as, a, as as an actor it's kind of like okay like you're just like going from situation to situation dealing with problem after problem yeah. and so, and now it's like and suddenly i'm brainwashed <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, right i think if i'm going to take a step outside of it i think it is kind of sad but also but also there's a hope behind it right because it's like sad that i'm kept in subjugation but also a set kind of lays the groundwork for Catherine to get Daniel Jackson and his crew through the Stargate again, and right. for Kasuf to lead his villagers. So, so I uh, take a little detour. When I got cast in the film, I I, I couldn't tell anyone that I was Kasuf, you know, or what I was right, working on. Yeah, right? Absolutely, they kept it a secret. They successfully kept, kept it a secret, secret up until release. I saw nothing. I heard nothing about any leaks or, or any inside information. So you must have kept your lips yeah. sealed completely shut. Yeah, I yeah I had to I had to, I had to but I did tell my parents. And they hadn't seen Stargate either. And so they watched the original movie and they texted. I got a text from, I can't remember if my dad or my mom, they were watching it together. They said uh, at, at the end of the movie, when, when they're at the temple and like Kasuf is there with the entire village, you know, to attack, you know, fight back. My dad, my, my dad goes, my dad, he, said, he just texted. He said, Kasuf leads the charge, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> so, you know, what's interesting is like, it's sad that I get brainwashed at the end of the origins, but also it does set the stage for, you know, what happens in the original movie. It's it's a sad thing, but there's a little bit of hope behind it, which I think is right. I think is an ideal right? ideal it's ending. Pretty a bittersweet, bittersweet, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about you as an actor and an artist. I know you said growing up you were 
a Star Wars kid, I'd love to hear a bit about your influences and what inspired you to become an actor, seek out that career, then maybe how you got to USC and broke into the industry. Sure, sure. Um, so all I wanted to be growing up was Harrison Ford. I was Star <laughs> Wars, <laughs> Indiana Jones. That was like, he I was just it. like, he was just the coolest guy. And uh, I didn't quite uh, grow into his stature, uh, but, <laughs> but, but he was who I wanted to be. It's like, we all want to be Harrison Ford. It's okay. Believe exactly. me when I say that. Ford, honestly. But growing up, I was always, you know, according to my parents, I was always kind of a storyteller. I, I was always, would always come home from school with a story to tell. But I wasn't active in theater in, in elementary school. In, in fifth grade, I, I refused to be a part of the school play. I decided that I would run the soundboard, um, which may have had something to do with stage fright, may have, may have had something to do with the fact that, you know, like the cool kids were part of the play and like, because everyone in school was part of the play. So it was like, you know, maybe I don't fit in with these kids. I'm just going to do, do the soundboard. But then in middle school, in sixth grade, I had kind of a teacher that changed my life named Betsy Quinn, who, you know, was one of those really important mentors in your life. Right. Um, and she kind of took me under, under her wing. And, you know, I, I learned about kind of the magic of storytelling through her class. And by the time I was in eighth grade, I was skipping my lunch periods and going down. Uh, I was going up to the theater room to, to help teach the sixth grade classes with her. Oh, that's so cool. And yeah. so uh, that was a really kind of important time and shift for me as, as a young right. creative. Sometimes it just takes one person, right? Just to point you in the right direction Absolutely. and change your perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I went to a, a public high school that had a really amazing arts program. It's like, that's huge. And then towards the end of high school, it was clear to me that what I love doing most is acting and telling stories. And so when I got into USC, my decision was to major in theater. And I was I, I knew that I was going to just like focus on that. But I also did a lot of improv and sketch comedy. I've been doing sketch comedy since I was in high school. That was another big thing for me. What year did you start at USC? Just just so we can get a timeline of how your college experience lined up with getting cast in, in Stargate Origins. So I was at USC from 2011 to 2015. While I was there, I was mainly doing student film work, student theater work. I was not auditioning outside of school because uh, I, I really wanted to have that kind of school experience. What's great about that is I, you know, I, I worked with so many. I, I did something over like over like 40 student films while I was there. It's is kind of insane. And what's great about that is I developed relationships with so many young directors and screenwriters and cinematographers. And like since graduating, I, I write a lot because I, I did a lot of sketch comedy, right? And so when I graduated, I was like, man, I, I miss doing sketch comedy. I'm just going to write a sketch. And, you know, I know so many actors and cinematographers and, you know, people who just want to make stuff. Let's just make something. And so uh, I wrote a sketch and I produced that sketch. I called up the DP and, uh, and uh, an actress and someone to hold the boom pole. And we, sh and we shot that. And so it was fun. So we just did it again. And so now I, I produce a lot of um, short sketches that are on Funny or Die and on oh, YouTube wow. and Facebook. So you have a comedy, a bit of a comedy inkling. Yeah, I think so. My my favorite movie is Little Miss Sunshine, uh, I which is love like Little Miss Sunshine. It's amazing. It's just a great movie, and, and I, so I think my favorite stories are ones that are similar to that in the sense that they're comedic and and humorous on a on a on a very human level, you know, because it's just people dealing with their, you know, their problems, and then it's got a, it's got a real heart to it, you know, like that's punch you in the gut without you even realizing it. Those are the stories that I love. That's great. So what, um, in terms of your career, what's next for you? Is there anything you want to tease that you're involved in, any of your own work? Yeah, so I'm just in Austin for South by Southwest because a film that I shot over the summer premiered there. It's called You Can Choose Your Family. You Can Choose Your Family. And it's with Jim Gaffigan and Anna Gunn and Alex Karpovsky and Logan Miller, Samantha Mathis, and me. And it was like a really amazing experience to get to work with some of my heroes. So I, I, I shot that in New York and then I traveled through Europe for a couple of weeks and then I came back to Los Angeles and I booked Stargate. So I was like going from that to, it was amazing. It was like, last year was, was amazing. So when I graduated from USC, I ended up, you know, a manager through like the showcase that I was a part of and then, right. uh, and then agents and stuff through that. So now I'm fully wrapped with a, with a great team. So I got that. Hopefully that'll come out sometime soon in the next year. I'm in this film called Bodied. Uh, Joseph Kahn film where I play a, a nerdy rapper who gets just destroyed on stage. A uh, very small role, but very fun role. Let's see what else I got. But I have a short film that I wrote and produced that's premiering at the Cleveland International Film Festival on April 7th and April 8th. So if you're in Cleveland, come on out to the Tower Theater 
and and I'm I'm constantly writing and, and producing. So so the, the sketch comedy channel that I started is called Giggle Break, and you can find us on Funny or Die. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube, and then you can kind of stay in touch with me and all the projects that I'm working on. I'm working on I'm currently working on a series and a feature film that I'm writing and will be hopefully producing in the in the near future. Well, it sounds like you're keeping very busy and you never a sleepless night, always in motion. So we'll look forward to watching your career and just welcome to the Stargate family. We're, we're glad to have you. And thanks again for making Origins so much fun. We really appreciate having you on the show and well, the Gate World show and, and Origins itself. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. I really want to thank you for your time and wish you the best of luck in the future. And if you have anything else to say, any nugget of wisdom to leave us with the listeners. <laughs> Dude, it, I mean, it, it, it's it's my pleasure. It's really cool to you know, as soon as Target Origins came out, it's really cool to see the positive fan reaction. There's so many people out there who are just so passionate about this series, and I, I really I really do appreciate the support of all those people because you know, as as a storyteller, that's that's how we we book work. You know, that's, that's how we we have the means to tell more stories is if people want want to watch. I'm very grateful for all the fans for watching the show and for you know, all, all the, the positive things that they've said about it. So many, many, many thanks. Many, many thanks to everyone listening to this and to watching the show. So thank you.